I shared this in the sermon sneak peek this week that, that some of my good friends had just returned from a trip to Japan. And, and they had an incredible time. And one of the highlights of their trip was exploring the city of Tokyo for two hours dressed in superhero costumes in go-karts. Now these go-karts go at speeds of up to 60 kilometers an hour and you are navigating Tokyo traffic. Yes. <laughs> and I didn't know this, but in Japan, you drive on the left side of the road. So here's another variable. And the traffic lights, the traffic signals in Japan are not the same as our traffic lights. They're just enough like them to make you feel a little comfortable until you begin trying to use them. There are red and green lights, but there are arrows and there are all kinds of things pointing up, down, left and right, and it looks like competing signals. It's interesting. Now, as my friend shared the story, it was, it was very clear to me that, that he recognized that these traffic lights, that they were important. He recognized that they were intended to have authority, that they're intended to govern the flow of traffic. But because he and his wife lacked an understanding of what these signals meant, they were of, of little use. Now, in our story from the Gospel of Matthew today, Jesus has an interaction with some of the leaders at the temple about authority. They want to know where Jesus gets his authority to do what he is doing and to teach what he is teaching. And so I want to invite you to open up the Bibles that you've brought with you from home, your pew Bibles or your mobile devices, to, to Matthew chapter 21. And we'll begin at verse 23. We'll get back to Tokyo. But I'd like you to consider your answer to three questions as you turn to the scripture. First is, do you recognize Jesus' authority? Or, or put a different way, is Jesus Lord of your life? The second, do you feel like you have enough information, like you know enough to even know what that means, what, what, what it would look like to follow Jesus. And then third, if you've answered yes to those first two questions, are you submitting to Jesus' authority in your life? Are you submitting to Christ's lordship? So friends, picking up at verse 23. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. You know, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd. For all regard, John is a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And so Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then Jesus tells this story he says, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. His son answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father then went to the second and said the same. And, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. So in this passage, there are these two different stories that I think at first feel a bit disjointed and sort of prompt the question, what is it that we do with the two of these? What does one have to do with the other? The first is this interaction between some of the Jewish leaders in Jesus, the chief priests and the elders. They ask him where his authority comes from. Now, I think it's helpful to know that, that earlier in this chapter, Jesus has his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus and the disciples enter into Jerusalem. It's a, it's a day that we typically recognize as Palm Sunday. So that's, kind of, that's where we are in the narrative here. And, and on that day, Jesus went into the temple and he kicks out a whole bunch of people whose livelihood are tied up in the sacrificial temple system. Now, we're not going to go deeply into that this morning, but it's just helpful to know that what Jesus did that day was disruptive. And so this is the very next day, and Jesus is back in the same place where he has caused this disruption, and he's teaching again. And so if we hadn't guessed it already, these leaders asking this question are not coming with a sincere question. They're asking this out of frustration. They're asking it out of anger. And so the leaders ask Jesus, where does your authority come from, in hoping to trap Jesus? Because he either says, from God, and can be convicted of blasphemy, or he doesn't say that, and he alienates his followers. Instead, Jesus proposes a third option. He asks them a question, not regarding their authority, but of the populist Jewish figure, John the Baptist, his cousin, John. He asks them, where did the authority for John's baptism come from? And he offers them two options. He says, from heaven or from humans. Now, in Hebrew, this would have been rendered meha shamaim from heaven or meha adam from humanity. And, and this is an idiom still used today in contemporary Israel. Meha shamaim, meaning, meaning from God. If you were to, later today, go to the Galleria Mall, which doesn't seem like many people are doing anymore, but if you were to go to the Galleria Mall later this afternoon and you were to bump into a friend that you have not seen in years and you were suddenly able to sit down to reconnect, you might say, gosh, that was a God thing. That, that, was, that was from God. That was really providential that we got to meet. That's the meaning of this Hebrew, this meha shemaim. Meha adam, on, on the other hand, from humanity, has the, um, not exactly, or excuse me, has the opposite meaning. It's, it's not simply that it's not from heaven and that it's from people, but rather that it is of an evil and spurious nature. So Jesus is saying, was John's authority from God or was John's baptism evil, unfounded, duplicitous? And so the leaders, they choose not to give an answer. And why, why is that? Because it's, it's, it's clear what the leaders believe, that, that it is meha adam, that it is from humans, but they don't say that. And the reason they give is this. If we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. You see, their response has everything to do with how that response will be received by all of those people around them. Their response to this question reveals what is motivating them what is most important to them. It reveals their, their engine. It reveals what is their Lord. In this case, public perception. As you think about those things which drive and inform your decision-making, particularly when it comes to uncomfortable situations, what is your engine? What is motivating your decisions underneath the surface? 
Who or what is your Lord? Because it's in these very situations when we are uncomfortable, when life is stressful, that this is revealed. After the leader's lack of response, as they reveal this thing about themselves, then Jesus moves straight into this other story that at first feels as though it has little to do with the previous interaction. And in the story, Jesus says, a man has two sons. The first, he asks to go and work in the vineyard, and the son says, he won't, but he does. And then it says he asks the second son the same question, and he says, I will, and he doesn't. And here is the connection, because this is a story about authority. Who ultimately submits to the father's authority in the story? Which son? Good, yes, it's not a trick question. The first one, right? The first one submits to the father's authority. Now, the second one is polite, right? The second is respectful in his response. I will go, sir, he says. That Greek word that's translated there as sir in this passage is the word kyrie, more literally translated as Lord. The second son says, I will go, Lord. Declares that the Father is Lord, but then does not do the will of the Father. The second son declares that the Father is Lord. The first son lives like it. Which one pleases the Father? It's still the first one, right? So have you, to go back to those original questions, have you declared that Jesus is Lord? And do you live like it? What our stories taken together communicate to us is to say that Jesus is Lord and to live as Jesus is Lord are not necessarily the same thing, and it matters. Is Jesus Lord is the basic fundamental question of our Christian faith. From it flows everything. It is the question. But if our answer to this question is yes, that Jesus is Lord, then it must have a profound impact on the way that we live our lives. Because if it doesn't, then our answer to the original question is actually no. And some of you are sitting in your seats and saying, Nick, what about grace? How can we be expected to live perfectly? Don't we get into heaven anyway? Doesn't God forgive us? Yes, but... These are the wrong questions to be asking. When we approach our walk of faith, when we approach the transformation that God is seeking to bring about in our lives, we don't start with, how much can I get away with? (laughs) Right? This conversation around faith and works and how the two are related, it's one that's been going on for 2,000 years. But the questions to be approaching our faith with with, after we declare that Jesus is Lord is then, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Jesus, how do you want me to live? Because here's the bottom line. The way that we live will reveal our real answer to the question, is Jesus Lord? Hear that again. The way we live will reveal our real answer to the question, is Jesus Lord? For some reason, we have created a cheapened Christian narrative that that says, as long as I know the password, 
As long as I say the the secret words, then I'm in. As though God is an oblivious cosmic bouncer at some prohibition era speakeasy just looking for lip service. Do you know the passcode? Friends, because of what Jesus has done, there is abundant grace when we fall short. Hear me say that loudly. This table that we gather around this morning communicates God's promise of abundant grace to feed us. And yet, we are still called to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, where does Jesus say to the leaders here, hey, I know that you all are living in ways that are dishonoring to God, but it's okay because in a week you're going to crucify me, I'm going to rise from the dead, and then you'll all be forgiven so you can keep on living the way you're living. He doesn't, right? He doesn't. Jesus consistently preaches a message of repentance to turn from our old life and to turn to a new life. He does it here in reference to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, how they have changed their lives. He does it in response to the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. He says, you are free to go. Now go and sin no more. So my friends did make it through the city of Tokyo safely. And they happen to be sitting here in worship with us this morning. They were assigned a a resident driver to follow. So this resident driver, who happened to be dressed as a giant pink bunny, followed all of the signals, obeys all the laws, and, and they simply emulated what the driver in front of them did in order to navigate the roads of Tokyo for two hours. It is exactly what we think of in terms of our discipleship within our Christian walks. Minus the costumes, which we may want to think about adding. (laughs) Friends, the truth is we are called to a challenging life submitting to Jesus' authority while surrounded by the abundant grace of God. And so let that truth both frighten and uphold you. We're not left alone to figure out what it means to follow Jesus and saying that Jesus is Lord. That is the gift of the church. We surround ourselves with people that know the rules of the road that can show us what it looks like to follow Jesus, to submit to his authority, and to embrace the new life that awaits us. Will you do that? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, as we prepare to participate in the Lord's Supper, today we also observe World Communion Sunday. As we come to the table this morning, we remember and celebrate our oneness in Christ with our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you, you will find rest for your souls. This is the Lord's table. Jesus is our gracious host. All are welcome. Friends, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, it is good and right that we lift up to you thanks and praise, O Lord, creator and ruler of the entire universe. Out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son among us to redeem us and to show us the way to eternal life. On the cross, your son offered himself a perfect 
sacrifice for the life of the whole world. By his suffering and death, he freed us from sin and death. Risen from the grave, he leads us to the joy of new life. Today, we remember the unconditional love your son has for all people across the globe and reminds us of the kind of love we are called to show one another. May this meal be a source of inspiration and courage that we might follow your example and lavish love upon one another in our congregation, families, neighborhoods, communities, and beyond. Send your spirit to preside with us that we might be transformed and nourished for the journey ahead. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord till he comes again. The gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take and eat. Take and eat.